So to summarize, we've picked the low-hanging fruit. You know, there are no more easy ideas to improve performance in an efficient manner. If you have to add too many ideas, that typically consumes a lot of power. And having hit the power wall, it is harder to add you know, very many complex features. The power wall also makes it harder to increase frequency. And as a result, our processes are not improving at dramatic rates anymore. So to make that discussion a little bit more concrete, uh, let me just kind of break down that 50% improvement in performance every year. So part of that improvement came from better processes, right? The fact that our transistors were getting faster. That was roughly a 20% improvement uh, in performance. Then we were able to put these transistors to better use with better circuits. We built you know, pipelines that were shorter and supported a faster clock. All of that led to a 15% improvement every year. And then with new architectural techniques, you know, say better prefetchers, better branch predictors, we were able to add an additional 15%. So in the future, as Moore's law starts to decline, we'll see that the help from some of these sources also starts to decline. So firstly, you know, because transistors are not getting faster and they're not getting smaller, we'll see that the first contribution will, will, will completely disappear. So this 20% improvement is going to go away because transistors are just not going to get that much faster. Then, you know, since we are not increasing clock speeds much more, you know, using a better circuit or a better pipeline, you know, this help will also start to diminish. So ultimately, we will rely on this third factor over here to provide us an impressive improvement with every new generation. And down over here, I'm kind of showing you how Moore's law influenced Intel. So for the longest time, they were building these single core processors with higher clock speed, more transistors. And then around 2002, 2003 is when they realized that you know, adding more features to a single processor leads to a high increase in complexity, leads to high power consumption, and that's when they decided to instead instantiate you know, multiple simple cores on a given chip. That led to the era of multi-core process. So I'm going to end with a few more specifics on how technology has been evolving, but before we talk about that, I think it helps to look at the manufacturing process and understand you know, just what goes into designing a single chip. Okay, so when you're designing a chip, the first thing you do is you take silicon, right? So silicon is basically sand, and when you, when you produce silicon, it comes in the form of these cylinders, and then you kind of take, take slices off the cylinder and you produce a single circular wafer. And now this wafer goes through a number of different manufacturing steps. The first thing that you do is you put transistors onto this, onto this wafer, and that is done by introducing impurities or dopant materials into the silicon and use that to make transistors. And all of this is done, all of this etching is kind of done with lasers and with, with better optics. And that's kind of the fundamental reason behind why you know, Moore's Law scaling happens. It's because our ability to do better optics improves every single year. So once you've done these, these, these etchings at nanoscale and created transistors, you then add metal layers onto this, the silicon wafer. Right? And so these metal layers are basically used to draw wires or to etch wires between the various transistors because the transistors represent the logic and the wires represent the communication between these, uh, these logical elements. Once you've done all of that, you test the wafer, then you cut up the wafer into rectangles, which are ultimately your chips and then you test the individual chips. And if there's a defect, you know, that chip essentially has to be thrown away, right? So out of this wafer, there are a number of chips that end up being thrown away. So all of these chips on the, on, on the boundary are really not complete chips, right? So those all get thrown away. In addition, if there's a defect over here, then this is a chip that also ends up getting thrown away. So, you know, that determines the yield from this wafer. After going through this complicated process, after investing millions of dollars on this process, there are a number of chips that are there are non-working chips and that have to be thrown away. So the yield ultimately influences the cost per chip, right? Because because all of your investments, you know, have to be amortized across the working chips. Okay, so yield is a function of well, it's not a linear function, but it is a function of the manufacturing steps. And it's also a function of the defect rate which in turn is a function of the size of the chip. Okay, so a good rule of thumb is that if your chip size reduces by a factor of 2x, it means that your yield uh, is going to improve and the cost of the chip is going to reduce by roughly 4x.
Okay, so the effect is more than linear, and that's because the impact of field, and there are you know more compl more complicated equations that underlie these phenomena, and those are explained in the textbook. And here's a slide that summarizes what uh, I just said. Now, because of our ability to etch out smaller and smaller transistors, we can see that the size of the transistor has shrunk from 250 nanometers in 1997. Uh, to about 35 nanometers in 2014 and you know maybe even 28 or 22 nanometers by the time you're watching this video right so transistor density has increased by roughly 35 percent every year uh, and that means that we have more transistors to do more things and as i explained earlier many of those improvements first happened to a single core and then once we hit the power wall we realized that you know adding those innovations to a single core increases power quite dramatically so instead, we kept the core constant, and we used these additional transistors to add more processing cores to the chip, and that led to uh, multi-core process. Now, transistor speed also improves linearly with size. So as the transistors became smaller, it meant that our circuits also became faster, and that led to higher clock speeds. Again, we've stopped increasing clock speeds now because of the power problem, but for the longest time, you know, this improvement in transistor speed also led to higher clock speeds. Now you should also note that you know as transistor speeds improve, wire delays need not scale at, at the same rate. Okay, because when you make a wire smaller, its resistance actually increases. So when you scale transistors down to size, it's possible that the wires now have to travel shorter distances, and that helps wire speeds. But because each wire is now more resistive, wire delays do not scale down at the same rate as uh, as transistor delays. So what I described so far was all the processor, right? We were talking about transistors and wires on the processor chip, but your system has other components as well. So besides the processor, you also have a memory system. You, know, you may have flash drives, you may have a hard disk drive, and then eventually you have a network that communicates with other systems. And if you look at the speed improvements or the technology improvements in these, you'll see that the latencies of the memory, which is also referred to as RAM or DRAM, that latency has not improved a whole lot in the recent past. Similarly, the latency for disks has not improved a whole lot, and the latency for networks have, has also not improved a whole lot. Right? What has improved in these three different components is the bandwidth and the capacity. Right? So memory capacity and disk capacity has improved dramatically, and bandwidth in each of these three components has also increased quite dramatically. So what I've covered until this point is a motivation for why you need to understand the hardware, and then an explanation of various technology trends, how processor speeds have improved dramatically, how that improvement was about 50% per year for a couple of decades, and has shrunk more to about 20% per, per year today. And the performance improvements may be even lower in the future. And what that demands is that programmers need to understand the hardware better so that they can write faster and more efficient programs and really exploit all the features on the hardware. What that also requires is for hardware designers to be more creative to find ways to improve performance without exceeding the power budget and you know without enjoying faster transistor speeds. So in the next set of videos, I'll look at performance equations and then move on to explaining the instruction set.